Welcome to day number two of Sew Along number four. Today, we're going to do the Katina. The Katina has uh, been re-released just in the past few days, and there are a few changes that I wanna talk to you about so that if you have the old Katina, you can still sew along with us. And I've got the old Katina instructions and the new Katina instructions, so I'll try to point out any differences as we go along too. But before you cut, um, you need to know when you get out your yokes, we have changed that seam allowance at the bottom to a half an inch instead of a quarter inch. So you will need to add a quarter of an inch to your Katina yokes, the front and the back. Also, there um, are dots that weren't there before, and they are right here at the corner of where the half inch seam allowance and the quarter inch seam allowance, um, where they connect. So be sure and put a large dot there. So it'll be a reminder that you, those are important and there'll be one on the other side as well as the other yoke. Um, you can look at our blog and get the, um, the uh, skirt chart measurements. Since we're making a tunic length katina, you won't need as much fabric. So there'll also be fabric requirements there. And, um, be sure and notice that there is a difference in the fullness between the old and the new, as well as the, the length. So, uh, let's see, what else do I need to tell you? Um, so when you cut your skirts, be sure that you have a, your um, armhole guide, because those will need to be cut out before we start sewing. There is, in the new Katina, there is an actual bias piece for the armholes. There's an actual bias pattern piece. I don't remember if there's one in the old pattern, but it is an inch wide and about 10 inches long, and you, that will be extra that you'll cut off, but that way you'll have enough no matter what size. There, uh, you need to interface your yokes. Just one interfacing. You don't need to interface the uh, lining, just the outer fabric on both yokes, and then as well as four interfacings for the um, strap pieces. So you cut four straps and you'll cut four strap interfacings, and that's the lightweight baby interfacing. Um, I think that's all I need to tell you for now. We'll pause while you have time to cut out. We're back. I hope you got everything cut out. The first thing we're going to do is make the piping. And so you will need the baby cord and then your bias strips that you cut from your pattern. Um, just a note, um, we have, as you probably know, lots and lots of tutorials um, on our website. And one of the newest ones is a tutorial on making piping and um, you will be able to see much better than you're going to be able to see today with me and that uh, tutorial should be up any day now. So I'm going to get set up and I will move the camera so that I can get as close in as I can um, and we will get started. Okay, we are ready to make some piping. The foot I like to use is a five groove pentuck foot. There are different feet out there, different machine manufacturers make specifically for this small cord, but this is my favorite. So I'm going to wrap the bias around the cord as tightly as I can, and then I'm going to put this under my presser foot and not try to sew right at the very end. So when you cut your bias strips, cut them a little longer than what you're gonna need. Now I have it placed in the second groove from the left, and I have my needle position just moved over one notch so that I can get just a little closer to the cord. And then as you sew, Use your fingernails to keep the cord tight in the fold of the bias. Okay. 
this up and do my other strip and then we will start construction. Now, first thing we're going to do, if you haven't cut your armhole out using the template, you need to do that. I took my two skirts and just folded them in half so I cut uh, all four armholes out at the same time. When you lay this out here, be sure that you have the top of the skirt where it says align with the top of the skirt. So after you've done that, we'll take that away. I'm gonna go through these next couple of um, steps pretty quickly because they're very basic, but we put right sides together and stitch each side seam of the skirts. So here and here, you can finish them however you want. If you have a serger, you can do that. Um, if you just wanna trim and zigzag and use a four for the width and a one for the length and let the needle go off the fabric when the zigzag swings to the right. Or you can even do a French seam if you would like. I'm going to do that and I think that's all we need to do right now. Okay, so now I have my side seam stitched, surged, and pressed, and we're going to move on to the next step, which is the bias bands at the armhole. And this is one of those places where it's a little different than in the older instructions. Um, we have you now go ahead and press the bias band strips together lengthwise. And that should give you a half an inch strip. Before, in the old instructions, you sewed the strip on without it being folded, and then you had to fold and fold again. So this just makes it a little bit easier. So I have right sides together because this is folded, both sides are, have the right side out. And we're placing it on the right side of the armhole. I'm going to continue pinning this on. I'm going to stitch using a quarter inch seam allowance. And then I will show you what comes next. So now I have my bias band stitched on my armhole curve. I'm going to cut off the extra bias. And then I'm going to trim just a little bit of the seam allowance. So that when we press the folded bias to the inside, 
we won't have any seam allowance sticking out. Now, if you wanted to at this point, you could put this down by hand. I'm going to just top stitch it. So I'll put a few pins in to hold it in place. And then what I will do is I will I'm going to take this to my machine and I'm going to stitch really close to that folded edge of the bias. So now we are ready to stitch the piping along the bottom edge of our front and our back yoke. Use your yokes that have the interfacing on and you just place the piping right along the edge. This is one of the things that is new from the old pattern in the instructions. Uh, in the old instructions, we had you pipe around the outer edge and leave the bottom unpiped. And um, we felt like it looked, it was a neater look to have the piping in, at the bottom of the yoke between the yoke and the skirt, especially if you uh, are attaching it to the smocked skirt. I really like the piping there. Um, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to put my five group pin tuck foot back on and stitch both of these down and then we will be ready for the next step. Okay, the next step is putting the gathering threads in the skirts. And remember this is a half inch seam allowance so your first gathering thread will be about a quarter of an inch to three eighths of an inch from the top and then five eighths of an inch from the top and we'll be stitching in between those two gathering threads. Now, be sure that you have your center marked on your front and back yokes, the ones that are piped now, and the center of your skirts, both the front and back, now you're ready to gather. Then when you start pinning, this is where these dots come in. That dot needs to line up with the edge, the finished edge of your armhole where you've already got your bias band sewn down. And that gives you a quarter of an inch right there where the piping is to, to um, hang off the edge there. Oh, almost forgot. Um, on each end, pull out a little bit of the cord from the piping. And that will make it much flatter and less bulky. Go ahead and get the other side. About a half an inch is a good amount to pull out. There. Now I'm going to mark or match my center of the skirt with the center of the yoke. 
keeping the raw edges even. And then again, putting that dot so that it is right at the edge of the armhole. Now I'm going to continue pinning, but I wanted to show you, um, Kathy uh, from the Children's Corner told me about this trick that she used last week um, because you are going to need to be sewing with this side up so that you can follow your piping stitching line. And sometimes when you're putting that onto a gathered skirt, things can happen underneath there that just don't make you very happy. So what she did is she took, I think she took Wonder Tape. This is Tiger Tape. You probably could even just use Scotch Tape. But just below where she will be stitching or where I will be stitching uh, is where you put the tape. So you don't want to be stitching on the tape and then you'll take it off. But that is at least one way to be sure that you don't get your, your gathers moving around too much or... Um, part of one gather getting uh, caught in the stitching line. So try that little trick and see if you like that. Now I've trimmed my seam allowance to a quarter of an inch. I pulled out my gathering threads. I'm going to press both the yoke and the uh, and the and the uh, seam allowance away from the skirt toward the top. So it'll look like that. Now, we're going to put that aside for just a second and stitch our straps. Right sides together. And you'll st stitch up one long edge, across one short edge, and then back down the other long edge, leaving an end open. So we'll do that now. Now we need to trim and turn our straps. Uh, trim the long sides and the end to um, an eighth of an inch, and then at the corner, clip diagonally just as close as you can get to your stitching without clipping your stitching. And then for turning, I like, this is called a stuff it, and um, actually it's one of my favorite tools. Um, and it's great to use for, um, you know, point any, anytime you need to, um, form a point where you've, um, stitched either a, a pointed collar or something. But so what I do is I just got a little bit of the end started in there. And now I'm going to get a little further in there. Then once it's going good, I stop and put this end in because I've been known to push too hard. But this is metal, so the fabric slides easily on it. And once I have it turned, then I turn this back around and put, this is a rounded tip, so it's not sharp at all. And then I can use it to firmly push my corners out. Now we need to press. Um, I like to start by pressing 
So you can see, I'm going to press with the seam up. I'm not going to press real hard, but um, I feel like I, I get a better result if I go ahead and press that seam, flip it over, press the other seam. I didn't press hard enough to get, you know, a permanent crease down the middle of my strap, but it just lets me get those um, seam edges a little straighter and smoother. Okay, now go back to your dress and, we're, and on the back yoke, if you didn't mark uh, or if your marks have gone away and you need to remark, but mark your uh, placement lines for your straps. And the open end goes between those two lines. Okay, you can go ahead and stitch those down if you like. We are now ready to put the yoke lining onto the yoke of your dress. So before we get that pinned on, I want you to press both the front and the back yoke linings a half an inch up on the bottom edge. So you'll do that with both of them. And then we're going to pin on and we're going to pin on right sides together, leaving that seam allowance folded up, but aligning it with your seam where your piping is right there. And then of course the, the raw edges. I think this is one of the main improvements we've made with the construction of the Katina. We put a couple of pins in there. Make sure you have that lined up. So now you can see why you needed that quarter of an inch sticking out beyond the finished armhole because that's where we're going to start sewing. I don't know how well you could see if I did this. Let me try. But this is where you're going to sew. It's right there and then continue a quarter of an inch around the yoke. So let me see if I can get that. And of course, if you're uh, looking at this on a um, cell phone or tablet, you can zoom in too. But that's what we're doing now. So this is what it will look like on this side. I think um, I think it's easier. I guess it really wouldn't make too much difference. I usually sew with um, the what would be the um, actual yoke of the dress, the the uh, the piece that is interfaced. I usually sew with that up, but I don't know that it would really make a whole lot of difference. So I'm going to keep pinning, and I will sew this on my, this happens to be my front yoke, I will sew this on my front yoke and on my back yoke. The only difference with the back yoke is you've got your strap sandwiched in between. Otherwise, it's the very same step. So you get started on that and we will pause. Well, after finishing up the Katina class, I was reviewing all the little clips before I send it on to the editor and I realized the step you just saw was not very clear. Most of the time you couldn't even see the fabric or my hands. So I've made a little mock-up because I did not want to make another dress. So this is the armhole, this is the skirt, 
This is the right side of the yoke. This is the yoke lining. So what I was trying to point out is the reason we had that quarter of an inch left there was because after this is pressed up a half an inch for the seam allowance, you place that on there, pin it on, and I'm just gonna sew it really quick. Then we trim that seam. I use these big old scissors. Flip what is the lining. Back to the inside of the dress. And see how that just flips around and encases, encases the seam allowance. So, I hope that makes that a little bit clearer. And yes, this is just what you think it is. Now we're ready to trim and clip especially at the curved edges right here, we'll trim to an eighth of an inch and then clip in where it's curved. It's not necessary to, to clip through here. This is one of those times that being precise when sewing around these curves is important. And believe me, it's not in my nature to be precise in sewing or in cooking. Maybe that's why my husband does a lot of the cooking at our house. So it, it takes an effort on my part to sew slow. Always in a hurry to get it done. Okay, now I'm gonna clip. Clip the other side. And we're gonna pray this looks nice. So now I get your point turner out and just run it along the curved edge, in fact, the whole top edge of the yoke. That's about as good as it's going to get. So the next thing we're going to do is press. And I'm pressing with the lining side up. And I'm doing that so that as I press, okay, I'm going to hold it up because you can't, you're not going to be able to see. As I press, um, I press so that I can see just a little bit of the outer fabric. This is on the inside of my dress. But if I can see a little bit of the outer fabric, then I know my lining is not going to show. Just a tiny, tiny bit. And you can see how having that yoke lining already pressed under that half inch, how that makes it easy to just flip it, <clears throat> I'm using my pink iron today. Um, flip it and tuck the seam allowance from where the skirt's attached, just right inside there. So it makes a nice finish, it's not really bulky. 
And then after after you've done that and gotten that to where you're happy with the way that looks right there, pin it. And same way with the other side, a couple of pins around the bottom of the lining. And the lining, the fold of that lining should be right at the stitching line uh, where your skirt is attached to your lining. So buttonholes, handwork, and a hem. Now on the tunics, we just allowed a um, one inch hem, but still go ahead and press it a quarter of an inch, then press it up an inch. And on things like tunics, I just top stitch it on. I don't I definitely don't do it by hand. I might do a blind hem sometimes, but usually I just top stitch it. So let's get the hem done, uh, your lining stitched down, and then um, I'll go over some buttonhole tips with you. See you in a little while. Let's talk about buttonholes for a little bit. First of all, let's talk about marking our buttonholes. Um, I said earlier, I usually don't mark my buttonholes at the first, I mark them at the end. Um, and one thing you need to know is you never want your buttonhole to start down where their seam allowance is. So I knew it was going to be up past the seam allowance. And I just measured from the stitching line, because that's now my finished line, over to the buttonhole line, and it was 7 eighths. So that's what I did. And I just put a mark at the bottom and then I took my button and placed it on my yoke and made a mark just beyond the button. So when you stitch your buttonhole, the first stitch needs to be right in that dot that you've made and the bottom stitch needs to be right in that dot. And that will assure you that your buttonhole is gonna be just a little bit bigger than the button, and that's what you want. Also, um, this is Solvy. It's just a, it's a water-soluble tear-away. If you have an embroidery machine, you're probably very familiar with it. But um, some of my sit-and-sew friends turned me on to this years ago. You get a prettier buttonhole if you put the Solvy down and then make your buttonhole. And then of course it just easily tears away. And then, then you cut your buttonhole. And I never use a seam ripper. Well, I, I don't even know if I own a seam ripper, but I, I learned a long time ago that I just should not use a seam ripper for opening a buttonhole, but I, you do need a sharp pointed pair of embroidery scissors. And then you just take little clips at a time until you get back to the bar tack. And there are times, these buttonholes are fine, but there are times when I feel like the two beads it's kind of what you call the these the lines going up and down, and these are the bars at the top, top and bottom. Sometimes I feel like that is awfully narrow through there, and um, if I if I feel like I'm possibly going to clip a thread, what I would do is put fray check or fray block, let it dry, and then cut your buttonholes open. If you insist on using a seam ripper then at the opposite end from where you are starting, put a pin like that, so that when you use your seam ripper, you don't just keep on going. Now, let's talk about your machine for a second. Normally, when um, you sew, you, you, know, you have a top tension and you have a bobbin tension, and Normally, you want those two ten tensions to, to equal so that when your bobbin thread and your top thread meet, they meet right at the fabric. 
You don't want your top thread being a little tight and then you see some bobbin thread and you don't want your bobbin being a little tight and pulling your top thread down beneath your fabric. But for buttons, um, I think I get a prettier buttonhole if I turn my top tension down to three. So I've got green on the top and pink on the bottom. So right now, I mean, this is this is an okay buttonhole. You can see a little bit of pink right there. And then after I turned my tension down, you can't see any pink, but you will see some green on the on the bottom. And you know, keep in mind, you usually don't have two colors of uh, a thread for your buttons, but it just makes a prettier satin stitch bead if your tension is just a little bit unbalanced. Let's see. I think, I think that's about all I have to tell you about buttons and buttonholes. I'm gonna finish mine and then I will see you in a few minutes. I hope you've enjoyed the Katina class. It's been a long time since I've made a Katina and I had forgotten how cute it really is. See you next week. Thank you.